Hello, I'm Professor Carenza Lewis from the University of Lincoln in the UK, and I'm going to be talking about the currently occupied Rural Settlement Project in England. This was a programme of research into medieval rural settlement development, and the project aimed to advance knowledge and understanding of today's villages, small towns, hamlets and farms through the excavation of one metre square test pits. Uh, the project started in 2005 and the fieldwork finished in 2018, after which uh, analysis and publication is proceeding. The background to the project was that a lot of research in England has been carried out into rural settlement, but most of that had focused on deserted and very extensively shrunken sites. Uh, the archaeology there is easily accessible, and it's also uh, reasonably easy to predict that archaeological features will survive because there's nothing sitting on top of them. And excavation of field work on these sites has told us a huge amount. Well, the problem is that deserted sites are only a tiny minority, probably only about 10% of settlements that existed in the medieval period in England became permanently deserted. Uh, and those 10% are also atypical. They're on the average smaller, they're poorer, uh, they're less favorably located, and they tend to appear later in the documentary records. On top of that, they're very unevenly distributed, as you can see from this map. So, we felt that to get a more representative understanding of medieval settlement, we needed to look at that other 90%, or at least the sample of them, the silent majority of non-deserted settlements that we termed currently occupied rural settlements, a term that made no presumption about their origins or how long or continuously they'd been inhabited. The CORS project ended up working on 80 different settlements, but it started off on just uh, half a dozen or so. We use test pit excavation, and that's because it's a great solution to the problem of working in currently occupied rural settlements, where you've got today's houses and shops and schools and roads and so on. One metre square test pits are small, so they can be fitted into unbuilt up space like gardens. They're quick to dig, so the garden owners are likely to let you excavate a test pit. And also, they're small, so they don't make much mess. And the aim, which needs good support from local communities, is to excavate as many test pits as possible across as much as possible of the currently occupied rural settlement. The method's very simple. You lay out a metre square, uh, you dig down it in layers, uh, you sieve the soil or sort the soil for fines, uh, and then you put the soil back and replace the turf. We use written guidelines and uh, paper pro forma recording to ensure each test pit was excavated and recorded to the same standards. All the test pits were excavated in 10 centimetre spits with the fines kept separate from each spit and each spit was given a different context number. Using this standardised written methodology meant that all of the test pits, whoever was excavating them, were completed to the same standard, which meant lots more people could be involved, which meant we could excavate more test pits. So the archaeological results have been enormous um, from 80 settlements. Um, I'll show you just one, which is from Purton in Hertfordshire. You can see the map of England here. The red dot shows the location of Purton, so it's in sort of central southern England. Um, and there's a photograph at the bottom of the page just showing you what the village looks like today. You can see from the aerial image that it's a nucleated settlement with all of the settlement tightly clustered together and fields around. So we could develop from this a series of distribution maps. And on each of these, the uh, white squares show the location of one of those one meter square test pits that didn't produce any pottery of this date. And the black circles are the test pits that did produce pottery of that date. And the bigger the pottery, at the bigger the circle, the more pottery that turned up. So this is a map showing the distribution of Roman pottery. And you can see from this very clearly that there's a large linear settlement on the northwest side of the map along the edge of a small stream. And then there's a small cluster of pits 
which are producing pottery in the southeast corner, the bottom right hand corner of the map, and really nothing in between. And you can even see, uh, looking back at the top northwest corner, you can even see a sort of penumbra of test pits uh, with very small numbers, just tiny single abraded sherds, which looks like those might be the fields of the Roman settlement. So moving forward in time into the early Anglo-Saxon period, we can see a really different distribution. There's no pottery of that date from anywhere on that settlement on the northwest side of the, um, the map. And in fact, only one test pit out of 114 that were excavated altogether produced even a single shard of pottery of this date right on the southeast side of the settlement, quite close to some of that Roman pottery, um, possibly part of a bigger area that extended beyond the area that's inhabited today. But certainly there's a major disjunction with the Roman evidence. Into the late Anglo-Saxon period, the 9th to 11th century, we can see very clearly we've got a nucleated settlement formed in the centre of the settlement here with a big red circle around it. And you can also see there's a cluster of a lot of test pits producing a lot of pottery on the southern side of the map. That's very much either side of a later 12th century castle. And it just hints at the possibility that that was a pre-Norman elite site as well. Into the high medieval period, the 12th to 14th century, we see the settlement absolutely exploding in size and density. Uh, nearly every test pit is producing large amounts of pottery, and we can see entirely new sections appearing circled in red here, including one just on the west side of that newly founded 12th century castle. It's like a planned extension to that settlement. The only place that seems not to have any pottery is the area circled in the green map, which looks like perhaps a village green. It's today just near the village pond. In the later medieval period, the later 14th to mid 16th century, we see a collapse in the number of sites producing pottery. Several streets seem to be entirely deserted and the number of pits overall producing pottery drops from 91 to 32. Not until the later 16th or 17th century does the, do the number of pits producing pottery start to pick up again. And even 400 years after the 14th century, uh, Perton has not regained its pre-14th century size or density. Now, because we've carried out excavation on so many cores in this project, any evidence we can find can be seen in context. So any one place can be compared to the others. So we can look at the graph for Perton shown in red here, uh, compare it with the average of all of those 70 sites in East Anglia. Um, we can see that Perton's got more than average in the way of Roman, early Anglo-Saxon, middle Anglo-Saxon, pretty much on average. Uh, more dynamic growth in the late Anglo-Saxon period into the high medieval, and then a really sharp drop afterwards. And then it more or less follows the average climb back, the slow climb back after that. One insight, and there are many, many that have come out of this data, but one insight I'll just talk quickly about is what it's telling us about the impact of the Black Death. And you can see this, this, is, this graph shows six main periods, um, and uh, the two that are circled are on the left, it's the high medieval period, the 12th to 14th century, and on the right, it's the late medieval period, the 14th to 16th century. And you can see the drop there, and you notice that at Perton, that 91 to 30 or so pits drop. Now, the Black Death is famous as a pandemic of plague from 1346 to 1353. It swept across the old world. But it's very difficult to assess the actual impact of it because documentary evidence is very sparse, even from England, which is relatively well recorded. We don't have population data. We can use tax records as a proxy, but they're very sparse and not entirely reliable and infrequently collected, uh, whereas individual manorial records that record mortalities are few and far between, there's only a couple of dozen, and in those the mortality rates vary from 0 to 100%, so it's very difficult to extrapolate from that. 
analysis of the cause of test pit data across those 75 settlements in East Anglia and another five uh, more widely across the country, as you can see on the map here, show precisely actually what that drop is after the 14th century Black Death. Uh, we look at the figures, 40% of test pits produce pottery dating to the couple of centuries before the Black Death, but only just over 20% produce pottery dating to the couple of centuries after the Black Death. And of course, we can also see this mapped. So uh, here you can see the whole of that East Anglia region where most of our research was focused. Uh, the bigger the circle, the higher the percentage of excavated test pits that were producing pottery. This is the before the mid 14th century map. And here's the after the mid 14th century map. And you can see that drop. 90% in fact of the settlements that we excavated in showed a decline in the number of pits producing pottery after the 14th century and overall the number of individual test pits with pottery drops by about 45%. So we can use that as a proxy for the drop in population, probably around 45%. So the cause test pit data is providing actually an entirely new way to both reconstruct and measure the impact of the Black Death and its aftermath. The 14th century had a succession of events that conspired to reduce the population. And in England, it took more than 200 years to begin to recover. Of course, by being able to map this data and in fact collect it from anywhere we want to, we can see where that impact was most severe. So the areas circled in black here um, have high percentages of pits producing pottery before the Black Death. But afterwards, we can see how hollowed out those areas become. And in fact, particularly on the, um, on the western periphery, periphery of our area, if we take out the one place that really does look quite major, which is Risley there, that data is skewed by the fact there's a late medieval pottery production site there. So if we take that out, we can see even more clearly quite how extreme the contrast is in those areas that were particularly badly affected. And then, of course, we can compare that data with other data and see how strongly the test pit data or severe depopulation or reduced population correlates with other phenomena such as the areas of open field system rather than enclosed pastoral landscapes, which is the area shown in dark green on the map on the left, and also how closely it correlates with the distribution of deserted sites, which from our data, it would seem, are only the tip of the iceberg of settlement depopulation. And we can then start to look at other data. Now we've seen this picture, we've started to go back and look at other forms of data. So completely different analysis looking at animal bone fragments showed again, a huge drop in the number of animal bone fragments, saying something about the number of people who were alive to eat animal. And looking at, again, a very different set of data, uh, non-coin small finds recovered by metal detectorists. Again, you can see from the graph at the bottom of the page, there's a sharp drop, again, dating to the later 14th century. But it's not just an archaeological new visions that this research has given us. The CAUSE project has been socially engaged, very publicly engaged from its inception. It works in the places that people are living in. It has to be, but it also wanted to be. From the very start, most of the people carrying out the excavation were teenagers who were taking part as a way of raising their aspirations and building skills for their educational future and for going to university. Thousands, more than 8,000 teenagers took part in the project. And we collected data uh, so we could, we know that uh, more than 80% finished it feeling more positive about going to university. And we actually assessed the individual skills they gained, uh, verbal communication, um, structured working, creative thinking, uh, reflective learning, effort and persistence, team working, all these sorts of skills we can actually assess how well they are gaining those skills so we know how they benefited. 
And then we also looked at the benefits of the community volunteers, because increasingly members of the public in the villages, particularly those where there have been school projects, got interested. And then other villages heard about the project. Again, thousands of people have been involved. Those 114 test pits at Purton built up year on year. We did five test pits in the first year there with the school group. And then local community got involved the following year. We did another 20 or so, another 20 or so in the year after that, more in the year after that, and in the year after that. So it was as a community project that we were able to get that huge amount of data showing us that development at the, in the village over nearly 2,000 years. And again, we've looked at the benefits to community volunteers. And recently, we've actually worked with psychologists to identify precisely what those benefits are. We get fantastic feedback. Everyone really enjoys it. They feel more engaged with their local heritage and so on. But we've actually looked at the uh, data we've done before and after surveys with control groups. And we can see that there are impacts on, for example, people's feeling of life satisfaction. The blue line here is the test fitting volunteers and the red line is the control group living in the same village but not taking part. Uh, we can see the impact on their feeling of social support, of feeling that people are there for them in their community, again rises. And their sense of place attachment as well. It's higher in people who get involved with the community, with the community test fitting before it starts, but it's even higher for the time they've finished. And this project is also now inspiring similar work in Europe, uh, currently working in the Netherlands, the Czech Republic and Poland, uh, with uh, other work hopefully going to take place elsewhere. So in conclusion then, this project has completed more, more than 2,500 test pit excavations in 80 English rural settlements. It's generated a vast amount of new archaeological data, which are advancing our understanding of the development of those individual settlements uh, and aggregated, revealing bigger pictures of change over time in events such as the Black Death, covering the whole of the me medieval millennium, uh, particularly from the 6th century to the 16th, while at the same time connecting people living in those communities with their medieval heritage in ways that benefit them, their communities, the places they're in, and research as well, and is now being extended to Europe. There have been a huge number of people involved in this project, thousands and thousands. Um, some of them are acknowledged here, and there are a number of publications as well where you can find out more about the detail behind what I've been talking about if you're interested. Thank you very much.